What's up, punks? Uh, it's Shinobi, and we're bringing you a special edition of Block Digest today. Uh, we got guest uh, Ragnar Lee today from Guns and Bitcoin. Uh, so what's going on today, Ragnar? Not much. Thanks for having me on this. This is going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And then um, Janine and Nopara, how's everything going for you guys today? Hello, hello. Nopara. I'm, I'm having a pretty interesting day. It's like everything I was working on in the last uh, five months is on hold, waiting for someone else. So um, I'm just fun coding, right? Like uh, updating the Tor library in Wasabi and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, that's a fun way to spend the day. So um, yeah, I guess let's let's just kind of dive right into it. Uh, so Ragnar, you've been uh, you've been talking quite a lot lately about a, a circular economy in Bitcoin and kind of getting that working and, and bootstrapped. And you've been catching a lot of flack for some of the things you've been saying and, and kind of arguing for that and talking about that. So you, you kind of want to just run us through like your own reasoning and point of view uh, there? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess I should maybe step back and just explain where I'm coming from and how this all got started. So. Yep. Yeah, so I've been doing Guns and Bitcoin for a little over a year. We were founded in November of 2018, so a little over a year. And obviously, a lot of the focus has been on on guns and specifically 3D printed guns. And I've gotten really involved in the community. And it's been such a stark contrast to Bitcoin, and especially what I see on uh, Bitcoin Twitter. Um really eye-opening very exciting i've really loved getting involved with 3d gun printing and and all the guys doing it because it reminds me of the earlier days in bitcoin when everyone was just more focused on i don't want to say um just just trying to actually i think change things and actually trying to be subversive and actually trying to use the tech in a very narrow specific way and only for those who want to do it and not trying to change the entire world. So that's that's one thing. Uh, another thing is they actually use Bitcoin. Um, they have to for their uh, fundraising and some of their crowdfunding and buying some of their parts. Um, I've donated Bitcoin. I've bought things in Bitcoin. I've you know donated Bitcoin to them. Bitcoin is the only thing they can use for everything that they do. And so for them they are actually kind of in a mini Bitcoin circular economy right now and have been. And then of course with guns and Bitcoin, we accept Bitcoin and the majority of our customers pay in Bitcoin. And then of course we try to, we don't immediately convert in Bitcoin. We try to pay what we can with Bitcoin. So like our server and uh, domain registrar and a bunch of other things, we try to pay everyone in Bitcoin. We can everything. So we still have to get some fiat. So the point is that after seeing this mini Bitcoin circular economy after seeing the 3D gun printing guys um, using it in the kind of subversive way for censorship resistance, for privacy, it's been eye opening. And another thing just on a kind of the social side is they, they're a lot more humble and they're a lot more just, hey, if if you have the results, you do. If you don't just kind of like there's nothing much you should be saying, right? Results speak for themselves. So there's not a lot of... Um, I would say kind of hypothetical scenarios or sort of this, um, you know, economic philosophy. It's not a lot of speculation and philosophy and abstract reasoning. It's it's basically like crypto anarchy, the philosophy, and then just results. So that's it, getting things done. So it's just been such a contrast both for the use of Bitcoin and the general um, social milieu, I would say. And there's not really a hierarchy. It's just whoever produces is more respected whoever doesn't doesn't so that's kind of was um what sort of like shocked me into 
some things and kind of broke up my thinking pattern and opened up my mind, I guess. So that was the first thing that was just got me um, my mind open to see a, the contrast. So, so like that's these, the first part. Yeah. So like these businesses, they're they're using Bitcoin because they they actually have to. Like there's no ideology here. It's this is actually steps they have to take to protect their privacy or create those those firewalls between the the operation and who's running it. Yeah, and most of these guys aren't aren't businesses. They're just creating parts. Like there's this thing to create a 3D printed Glock frame. And so for the Glock frame, you need these two metal parts. They're little aluminum rails. And someone who we don't know the real identity, it's pseudonymous. He calls himself Railman. He he actually sourced these from a couple different places and then started to sell them because you need them for the gun. And he he wasn't set up with a store or anything, um, so he couldn't accept credit cards, and he wouldn't even if he could. And so he accepted Bitcoin, and that's just one example. So yeah, they actually had to use had to use Bitcoin. So that's that's the first thing. And then the second thing, in terms of um, focusing on results rather than kind of the virtue signaling purity test, is they've used Keybase first of all. Second of all, for their file hosting. They've used something called library, which it has its own token. And when they first were moving on to this, I, I said, well, I don't think that's a good idea because, you know, it's an altcoin and why do they need the token? And what is this? They have a database. And, and I was skeptical, but you know what? It's worked for them. It's the only thing that's worked. And at first they were trying to anchor things to, to Bitcoin blockchain. They're trying to hash, you know, certain file locations, but it just, it just was hard to do. But library was like, right out of the box and it's worked and so the point is that they focus on results and library has been the only thing that's worked for their file hosting and um indexing before they were on mega you know mega nz with mm -hmm. kim.com and they got kicked off of that um they got for, for file hosting um and then in terms of social media they've most of them got kicked off of reddit uh twitter several times facebook everything else and so with keybase they've been able to do encrypted chat they've been able to also host some files on there they've been able to move their identities over to there and then another thing is uh you know people don't like stellar because they say oh or excuse me they don't like Keybase because they say, oh, they use Stellar Lumens and that's a shit coin and I'm too pure to use Keybase because of that one thing. And so, yeah, Stellar Lumens are dumb. But hey, and, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. And the fact is, is Keybase, it's because of Keybase that things have progressed so quickly in 3D gun printing. So while, while some people on Bitcoin Twitter, you know, clutch their pearls and say, oh my gosh, Keybase Lumens, well, guess what? These guys are getting shit done. And so... You know, you know, I have no problem with Keybase. Like we we use Keybase to to coordinate stuff for the digest. It's like we just don't use the the Stellar feature. I mean, it's it's not that difficult of a, a choice. Yeah, it, it's like it's like uh, walking past. It's like you're going for a walk and you see this flower that you don't like. Well, so what? You're not going to stop going on your walk because there's something you pass by and don't like. And but in terms of the lumens, actually, it's also been good despite it being a shit coin. You know, they there've been a couple airdrops. And so people have donated, uh, a lot of people have donated their lumens to the uh, main kind of developers. There's, there's a, a couple of guys, four or five. And so if you look at the Deterrence Dispense team, which is the main 3D gun printing team, people just seam seamlessly sent their lumens to them. And then they were seamlessly able to convert that to Bitcoin via Changely. So a lot of these guys, you know, they're in school, they're students, working class. It's not like they're they're well funded to do what they do, but through the lumens and the, and the airdrops, they've been able to have some money to buy ammo and materials and everything else. So despite it being a shitcoin, these guys are getting things done. That's and that's all they care about. So so everything I've just talked about has been sort of shocking to me and, and first cracked open my mind. I have a quick because you mentioned um mega kicking them off how did because mega is supposed to be end-to-end -end encrypted so how did mega even know that they were using it like did they actually were they actually able to see the content or what was the reason you know i don't know i, I maybe the, the label of the files i don't know how they they were able to maybe because they were linking to the files and so they said hey find these gun files at this location and maybe mega saw hey that's us it says you know mega.nz or whatever and that's my guess but i'm not i'm not sure 
Yeah, but they were like able to. A, a massively hypocritical thing for somebody like uh, Kim.com to do. Yeah, and that was that was they thought they were going to be safe on Mega, but obviously they you know Mega's under different pressures. So it's been really tough for them to actually find a home, and it was with Library, this supposed you know shitcoin altcoin thing, and it's been the only place that's allowed them you know to do this. Besides BitTorrent, okay, BitTorrent's you know, hard for most people to use. That that thing. I'll, I'll just touch on real quick. Like I'm, I'm not familiar too much with library specifically, but that type of Filecoin project, like it, eventually somebody will build that with Bitcoin. It, it's just BitTorrent and IPFS usually slapped together with a token. Like you, you can just pay for yeah. that Bitcoin. That that will solve itself down the line. Yeah. Yeah. I I was I was using IPFS back when they didn't have any coin and it worked and it was fine. So it's gonna happen. Yeah, absolutely. And we said, why don't you just use IPFS as it is? And it was a lot more difficult to use than just libraries. So they said, why why would we have brain damage and people not be able to use it just because people say it will be solved with Bitcoin? And I agree it will, but it's not today. So, you know, that's what they use. Yeah. I mean, I can't really blame somebody who has a real need right now that's not my... I mean, this is why... I, th I think Monero is something that's a dead end in the long term because it's unscalable. But I don't shit on people for using that right now the way I do for other things because unlike most other things, right now at least, it's meeting a real need. Yeah, and that's supposed to be what matters. Like Bitcoin is supposed to be a tool. Like Bitcoin is supposed to serve us. We don't serve Bitcoin. And so people kind of forget that like, hey, what are our goals here? What's a good tool? Well, sometimes it's bitcoin sometimes it's you know keybase sometimes it's twitter mm -hmm. so, so i guess you know um yeah i guess to kind of slide uh, a bit forward you know i think a lot of the the kind of message you've been trying to to preach is the importance of that circular economy and one of the things you keep pointing out is just the the difficulties right now in, in trying to be one of the people bootstrapping that yeah that that definitely is part of it, but just um, to step back uh, again, and, but I will get to that. So this, all these things I've described have sort of opened my mind. And then I started to think more critically about everything and kind of examine my assumptions and anything that I thought of and trying to attack them and say, okay, I had this belief Bitcoin is selling money. Well, let's attack that idea. Um, let's attack all these different things, hodling. And, and so I just started to think critically about everything. And then when I started to, th to do that, I started to see the holes in the Swiss cheese, so to, so to speak. I started to see flaws and arguments and assumptions that I couldn't justify. And one of them was the overemphasis on hodling, number one. And number two, the fact that we had kind of drifted away from using Bitcoin as a currency or in the circular economy. And, and that was just kind of the, the 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 main the main thing I guess that I saw was the overemphasis on hodling, and now I'm seeing other things. So to get to your your question or point, Shinobi is is yeah, that's how I got to this circular economy as part of a larger, I think, um, critical thinking and adversarial thinking about Bitcoin, and and just the hodling uh, Bitcoin for payments thing is just the first and biggest. Uh, result of, of that critical and adversarial thinking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I think kind of jump in before we move, uh, move along a little further. As you know, my kind of take on all of this is I see the, the whole situation as, as very nuanced depending on w what you personally are trying to get out of Bitcoin. You know, to, to me, like, I, I hodl. Um, I, I think that's an important meme because I think a lot of people if this does succeed in the long run, don't really understand the the trade-off they're making in terms of the purchasing power they're realizing now versus what it could be down the line. And it's not to say like never ever spend your Bitcoin, but you should be thinking about whether spending your Bitcoin on something is actually worth it way more than using any other form of money. Because it, it, it really, if this if this does work, you're not just spending the hundred dollars you're spending now. You you could potentially be taking ten thousand dollars and throwing it at whatever you're buying. 
And people should think about that because, you know, right now where, where the price is now, yeah, that might not seem like that, that Bitcoin matters that much or makes a big difference in your life. But five years from now, 10 years from now, maybe it could have. Yeah, that's a good point is, is the nuance and everything you said. But the problem is we can't even understand the nuance or understand anything you said, because if people aren't even open minded enough and critical thinking enough, then we can't have the conversation. And it's like, like you said, people said, oh, you don't hodl. It's like, no, I hodl. I've been hodling for a long time. I, I'm going to shave my head when Bitcoin reaches 100,000. And so they immediately say, oh, I never spend your Bitcoin. No, I, I didn't say that. And they said, well, Bitcoin for retail payments, uh, that's not true. That's what Roger Ver wants to do. No, I didn't say retail. I didn't say mainstream. And so the real problem I see isn't like the the debate or conversation, what's the balance between hodling and spending, which I think actually a lot of people are on the same page. It's just not even being able to even discuss it and everyone's straw manning the argument. So to me, that's the bigger hurdle than even even discussing it. Yeah, yeah I, I I feel like that mentality, like, because so far we've we've lived for a number of decades in a world where basically you're pressured to spend your money. You can't, no, most people don't even have like $500 saved. And so I don't, yeah, we shouldn't be going to the opposite extreme where it's like, don't spend it on anything. It's like, no, the whole point of this is that you should be conscious about your spending. Like, like, is this worth it for me right now? Is this going to be worth it in 10 years, five years, whatever, like long-term thinking, but not like, don't ever spend it all because uh, in order to eat, like a lot of people, the reason they can hodl is because at some point someone gave them Bitcoin, someone spent it on them because they thought it was worth it. So you have to have some kind of spending, whatever position you take. I have a question too, that's going a bit backwards now because I didn't get to ask. In fact, I have three questions and I'm going to just put it into one. That uh, could, you, could you enlighten me about the history of pre 3D printed gun? Uh, when did it become a thing? And what's the involvement of Cody Wilson in it? What is his status now? And was Amir Taki involved in it at all? Or it just it was just dark wallet? It was just Cody Wilson was trying to do Bitcoin stuff. Okay, so three-part question, what's the history of 3D gun printing, uh, status of Cody Wilson, and then Amir Taki and and um, the Dark Vault? Okay, yeah, great questions. So, you know, it it's actually goes back hundreds of years where people have been making their own weapons for hundreds of years, actually centuries. But if you want to talk about firearms specifically, yeah, that's been going on for centuries. So in that sense, 3D printed guns aren't anything new at all. It's just you know, like a new way to do it. And it's always been legal, by the way, at least in the United States, to make your own weapons. So this isn't anything new. Now, in terms of the actual 3D printing itself, yeah, it got kicked off by Cody Wilson and Defense Distributed, I want to say 2011 or 12, when they produced their first gun, which was the Liberator. It was just a one-shot pistol, not very functional. I think it was like 90% plastic. They had to put in a couple metal parts to be legal. And that's what got started. And then the current state of Cody Wilson, his current status is he pled guilty to a couple of charges, but he's still active in the 3D gun printing community. But now he's, I mean, I don't ever hear his name spoken in any of the four any of the key base teams, he hasn't produced anything that I'm aware of. So he's there, but where he used to be sort of 90% of it and his defense distributed team was 90% of 3D gun printing now, I, I, I would put a very low percentage on it. Um, so it's become much, much more decentralized, like a lot more. And then in terms of Amir Taki, I know he was with Cody Wilson back in the day. I guess it'd be 2014 or so. And they did collaborate on the dark on the dark wallet. But as far as I remember, it didn't go anywhere. And um, and then Amir Taki isn't involved in, in 3D gun printing at all, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about... Okay, so no one is talking, so I'm going to ask another question. Uh, are you familiar with what's happening in Hong Kong? Um, yes, yeah, so that was that's a good topic because it brought up some issues of 
of when are guns needed and appropriate because most people want to talk about guns in terms of hunting or defending yourself from a robber. But when we saw what happened in Hong Kong, it reminded people, well, you really need weapons against the state. And people saw that with Hong Kong. And so people had this idea, well, let's, you know, maybe the Hong Kong protesters can print guns. And a, a couple of the 3D gun printers here in the U.S. were talking to some people over there. I wasn't, but but they were. And it kind of didn't go anywhere um, just because it's not a gun culture. And the other part is they weren't they weren't willing to print them and I think even use them, you know, because because gun, guns are just a tool. But if no one's willing to to take that risk and get violent like that, then it's it's not going to happen. So it, nothing much has happened in Hong Kong in terms of 3D gun printing, except for one thing was there's a guy over there who has come up with a way to partly make your own bullets, um, specifically in the the powder that you use. Um, and so he was able to make this smokeless powder, which is an important step to make your own own bullets. So that's the only thing I've seen come out of Hong Kong. Okay. Do you guys want to jump back to kind of the talking about circular economies building? Okay. Um, I guess I can jump in unless you guys want to. I mean, we were kind of talking about like you're trying to get into like the the issues and problems with like being the the bootstrappers and that. Yeah. So in terms of a circular economy, like I said, it's the the first hurdles is a lack of critical thinking, open mindedness and adversarial thinking. So, uh, you know, you guys are able to do that. So that's why we could actually talk about this in an intelligent way. So the other the key with this is scale. Right. Like anything else, there's scale. How does Bitcoin scale? How does a governance scale? How does a family scale? Whatever might be scale is so key. And so for this sort of circular economy, it's so much about scale. And whereas everyone thinks when I'm talking about a circular economy, it's supposed to be like a nation state size economy. Right. Like I can go to Starbucks, pay for Bitcoin and then Starbucks is going to pay their employees in Bitcoin. And all that's like, no, I'm talking about a scale that's very, very small. Like it can be 50 people. That could be a Bitcoin circular economy, 50 people. Um, and I've seen a mini one in 3D gun printing. And so that's what it's about is, is just trying to start at a very small scale, first of all. Second of all, it's not 100%. It's not unless you're also able to pay your rent in Bitcoin, you don't have a circular economy. It's No, it's just it's it's you know on a scale. It's on a spectrum. And the goal is to try to pay for more things in Bitcoin and try to get more people to get paid in Bitcoin and to pay for things in Bitcoin. That's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And I think that's the realistic goal. Well, I think like kind of that, that introduces a, a big problem with an inflection point when you're talking scales there, because like those type of smaller scale groups, like, yeah, they can have a closed loop economy if everything in that economy is produced in that closed loop otherwise you you have to go interact with some producer or supplier or entity outside of that loop and now the arbitrage issue comes in like will they accept bitcoin no okay how do you get fiat currency and now you have the it builds up that arbitrage between fiat and bitcoin and whatever goods and services you're trying to acquire and it's the liquidity in that arbitrage that that really dictates how effective somebody can be in in getting what they need from outside of that loop. Yeah, that's those are exactly the challenges, and that's why it's not going to be a hundred percent closed economy. Like maybe that's kind of a misleading word for me to say closed, but I think of it as just a parallel economy, sort of an alternative one where you're trying to slowly take a percentage out. And I guess we should talk about like the reason why we would want to do this, not just why I love Bitcoin. So I just want to have everything in Bitcoin. To me, it's it's a huge, important issue because of uh, the reliance on KYC AML exchanges. I mean, this is biggest the biggest Achilles Hill in Bitcoin right now. I mean, th- this is where the government controls Bitcoin. So that's that's one thing. So if people want to get off KYC AML, if they want to get off of surveillance, then this offers a good alternative for people to acquire Bitcoin off of though. That's by earning Bitcoin. And the only way they could earn Bitcoin is if people are willing to pay in Bitcoin. So having sort of this parallel economy can help more people acquire Bitcoin out of the exchange. That's the first thing. The second thing is taxes. So the way that, that the government is controlling Bitcoin to a certain extent is through the exchanges and through taxes. Because I just had this Twitter conversation with Stefan Levere 
uh, kind of last night and this morning, and he actually is can have an intelligent conversation. So I, I like him a lot. But he was talking about, well, the reason why people don't want to spend their Bitcoin is because, you know, taxes. It makes sense. Every time you spend Bitcoin, it's supposed to be a, a tax transaction. So he said there's that incentive not to spend Bitcoin, which is exactly the problem, right? So if the government knows how much Bitcoin you have, and if they know when you spend it because you got it on exchange or you're spending it through Cash App, then they are creating the incentive to use Bitcoin. No longer is Bitcoin as sovereign as we thought because now the government can influence decisions about Bitcoin. So the less you have Bitcoin in and out of fiat, in and out, in and out, then the harder it is for them to have that power. Yeah. I mean, I can't find anything to disagree with in what you just said. In addition to obviously, you know, the, the privacy, because if, you know, like uh, we sell a hat and guns in Bitcoin and someone pays in Bitcoin, well, that's, you know, $30 of Bitcoin that we have that I didn't buy on Coinbase or Cash App. Um, that's, you know, that's privacy. Um, and then, you know, and then the other thing with censorship resistance is like these guys, even the gun shops, right? So um, PayPal and Stripe will not do any business with any gun related businesses, not even like firearm related businesses, like a, like a holster or, you know, whatever a gun, a gun itself, I could kind of understand. And then we've seen how so many of the gun businesses, like the YouTube channels, uh, the bloggers, um, the mom and pop e-commerce stores on Shopify have been pushed out. And so the reason why they haven't accepted Bitcoin is to say, well, no one will pay for anything with Bitcoin. And so it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. But it's like, if we don't do anything, then then fuck it. Like, why are we, I'll, you know, fine, I'll just buy Bitcoin and hodl it along with my stocks and gold and real estate. Like, that's, that's we just throw up our hands. Oh, it's too hard. Oh, it's a chicken and egg problem. Oh, I have to pay taxes on it. Oh, well, it might be worth something someday. It's like, well, fuck. See, here's where I think the core of, of, the, of the, the, the animosity in trying to engage on this, this topic publicly is coming from. Because exactly, it is a chicken and an egg problem. So it needs all of these pieces growing at once. It needs more people buying and hodling so they have it. It needs more people accepting and using it where they can. It, it needs all of these things growing in concert because ultimately, if there isn't the liquidity, then there's not going to be enough of the Bitcoin for a large group of people to use it. And so no one will use it. Like all of these things are, are tightly intertwined. Like the, the whole world can't use a, a token that collectively is only worth a hundred billion dollars uh, of value. That's not enough value for them to transact with. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think Bitcoin is never going to go mainstream because of those constraints. And so when people say, oh, I'll just wait for hyper Bitcoinization, that's when Bitcoin will be you know, the currency and therefore we won't have to have these problems of paying capital gains taxes and transaction taxes, then hyper Bitcoinization solves everything. Um, and, and you, you know, kind of alluded to that with the liquidity and the size. And so like, I agree. And that's why going back to the scale thing, I think it's only realistic on a small scale. And that's what I'm more focused on and okay. trying to say. So I think that you're completely wrong on that. And here's why I think like, it, think of like the, the, the globe, like if you, if you set off a, a, a radio wave or something, it's going to ripple out around that globe to the opposite point. So think of, think, think of that happening from both sides. On one side, you have the, the, the privileged developed world with, with all the, the, the money and the wealth. And on the other side, you have the, the, the poor developing world that, that has had all their wealth extracted from them. The more liquidity that the Western world pumps into Bitcoin, the more stability it gives in those third world places relative to their own currency. And they, they have the resources there to sell, to manufacture, to, to bring in flows of Bitcoin. They just need to, to do it. And so... It's, it's, a, it's attacking it from both sides. The more the West freaks out about Bitcoin as an investment that they should hodl and, and just throws money into, the more places in the developed world where Bitcoin actually becomes usable as money. And I think that those two things are they're going to meet at some point in the middle. And then who knows what happens then? 
Yeah, I I can see that argument, and there's many arguments similar of how it happens. So let's take that as true, then thinking adversarially and working backwards from that. What are the steps from you know there to where we are today? And 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 trying to get specific. And this is another thing is like okay, specifically, what are the steps? Like exactly what percentage of the population is hodling Bitcoin or using Bitcoin? Is it two percent? Is it fifty? Is it you know? What, what is it? And you can't get exact numbers, but at least let's kind of get a ballpark of what we're talking about. And I actually think people are way underestimating the power of the state and specifically the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is basically influencing how Bitcoin is used just through its taxation, KYC, AML. And we know that they will bomb entire countries if they even have a whiff that their currency might be affected. So when people start saying, oh, I, I, I just think that the U.S. government will push back on Bitcoin so hard way before it reaches a critical point where they can't not do it. And not only the U.S., but so will China, so will Russia. They're more interested in, I just think we way underestimate the state, okay, I guess the short well, version. I don't think that's a correct assessment of what's going on right now. Uh, we There's no way we can just bomb Russia or China or most European countries. We, we can't do that in the same way we can go play soldier in Africa or the Middle East. And really, China, I don't think they're going to do that. They've, they've given themselves the option. They've raised the foot above everybody's head, but they're just holding it there. And Russia is literally like state-owned power companies in Russia are now building facilities to host mining equipment. The, the Central Bank of Russia's gold accumulation in 2019 dropped by 50%. And we don't know what they did with that money instead of buy gold. And America, at this point, um, Wall Street is, is soaked in, in Bitcoiners who know how to grease all the right wheels with all the incentive to do so. Like, I think at that scale of governments, of we're already... It, at that point where they're being sucked into the incentives of Bitcoin and they're reacting just like everybody else is here. They're trying to get their edge to benefit their selves because that's more reasonable. Yeah. So going, going back to Russia and China, what I meant by that is each country not going after other countries, but with within. And so if the U.S. thinks its own citizens, you know, Bitcoiners using Bitcoin ha will have any effect or threat on them, they will simply shut it down effectively. And by that, I mean, they will seize the Bitcoins in the exchanges. They will shut down the exchanges. They have a list of people who own Bitcoin because of the IRS filings, because of their usage at Coinbase and Cash App. And they will say, you know, turn it in just like they did gold in 1933. And then people say, no, because I have my private keys and you can't break uh, math and stuff like that. And the government will simply say, you know, you're going to pay this and, or we're going to seize your assets. We're going to fine you. We're going to take away your property. You're going to go in jail. Like, yeah, maybe they can't get your Bitcoin, but they can get everything else. And so that will effectively shut things down 95%. And there's always going to be people who have. Yeah. I don't really think so. I mean, they don't have the manpower to go after everybody. And even the ones that they will have the manpower to, I mean, I don't think that would fly, Ragnar. I mean, look at what's going on in this country right now. It's like, look at Virginia. Like, something like that would start a war. Like, the, the, the U.S. government has pushed people way too far over the last 20 years. And they, they can't keep just pushing without having to consider the consequences of that. Well, they wouldn't do it all at once. I mean, the U.S. government is already doing it. I mean, they're already enforcing taxes when everyone said, oh, they can never collect taxes. And they're already controlling the exchanges. And so all they have to do is slowly ramp it up, flip the switch, and it's easy. I mean, we we, underest we overestimate how many Bitcoiners are and how much wealth there is. I mean, if you look at um, Jeff Bezos, the richest man, his net worth is almost the market cap of Bitcoin. And so then if you say, OK, it's almost the market cap of Bitcoin, what percentage of that is in the U.S.? Let's say it's half. Then Jeff Bezos' worth is worth more Bitcoin than is in the U.S., so to speak. So I, I think they can easily do it. And I think they're doing it right now. And so my question is, how come people aren't, how come people right now are going to comply 
with tax regulations? And what alternatives do people have? I'm just thinking adversarial. Let's just say that the government does really clamp down on, on exchanges. What alternatives do people have to acquire and spend Bitcoin? Um, are people not complying with their taxes right now? That's that's the question to ask. If if that's going to happen in the future, why isn't it happening now? When that when the when the consequences for doing so are minimal compared to what could happen if things get serious? Well, you know, it's I just don't buy that argument, Ragnar. I mean, you can say that about anything that the government has tried to ban, and people just do it anyway. I mean, like me, I smoked weed almost my entire adult life. I, I don't I don't really give a shit what the hell the government thinks about that or says about that. I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, and that's the most common comparison is between drugs and Bitcoin. And they say, well, the government tried to ban drugs, and obviously they haven't been able to. But drugs aren't at all like Bitcoin. Drugs are very powerful. And whereas Bitcoin, it's it's like not compared to drugs. Like maybe for I think it is. I think that greed can actually be more powerful than drugs. Well, look at what percentage of people actually own Bitcoin right now. It's probably in the US. Let's say it's two percent, maybe three percent at the most. How many of those think of your average person who owns Bitcoin? What percentage of those people would say, I'm going to trade Bitcoin, I'm going to get Bitcoin um, through some means, not through Coinbase? I mean, this is not going to happen. Even the most hardcore Bitcoiners that, that would say they will, they, they won't. Like if Trace Mayer says, like if, if Trace, if, it hap- if this all happens, I can't see Trace saying, no, I'd rather go to jail. I'd rather risk going to jail and losing all my Bitcoin. I could be wrong. But the fact is, is unlike drugs, most people aren't going to take these risks, especially the average see, Bitcoiner. I mean, there's just I, I just can't see that. That that's that's not how like market flows work, though, because here's how it, how here's how it works. Trace could go sell some Bitcoin to some other guy and pay his taxes and declare it. And that other guy could go sell his coins that he got from Trace to a few other people and pay his taxes and declare it. And then those people can just disappear and start distributing things in, in, in the black off the radar. And like the, the types of technologies, I mean, like Ragnar, like people love to, to, to point at things like BISC as far as decentralized exchanges. There are things people are working on in this space I know you're aware of that actually physically distribute the 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 network used to arrange bitcoin trading like th- i think there are absolutely ways to deal with governments getting that stripped oh yeah absolutely i mean and they they will always someone will always be able to buy and sell bitcoin but it comes back to scale and so yeah bitcoin will be unstoppable for what 100,000 people in the US who really need bitcoin it's not like drugs you buy it and you consume it and hey, you used it. Whereas if you buy Bitcoin and you can't use it to buy anything and you can't really hodl it very well because you don't have a way to cash out realistically, uh, I just don't see that being enough. I think it just takes away from Bitcoin's power so, so much that you can't compare it at all to drugs. Let's let's go through this though. If, if, that, if it, they cramp, you're clamped down in America, then less people would hold it in America. Bitcoin would slowly flow out of America to places where governments didn't act like that. And so less people would would have or use Bitcoin or benefit from it in America. But millions of other people all over the rest of the world would. Yeah, possibly. But again, at what scale? Like what there still will be what one percent of say French using Bitcoin, one percent of you know the British using Bitcoin. Yeah, and but if they- if ninety percent of Africa is using Bitcoin though, I call that a win. I mean, yeah. like, I personally so I. think so that in, in our lifetimes, we very well might never get past the point where Bitcoin is looked at as just an investment in the West. But if it explodes in the third world and lets them bypass all of the problems centralized financial infrastructure creates, I don't care that, that people are still idiotic in the West, that it's just a stock to people over here. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's helping the world. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, I I agree. And see, this is this is the uh, kind of the crux of the issue is when we go from what it could do based on assumptions of, you know, say 90 percent adoption in, in Africa or all these other things, those are hypothetical. And I believe if these things come true, that would be absolutely the case. 
But my point is, okay, let's assume that that is that happens. Let's work backwards. And what are the 10 steps to get there? And to me, I don't see those laid out other than if this, if that. And if we start from where we are today, I just look at the behavior today we have and start here and then project that moving to that Here's point. Here's the steps. You know, that's that's it. Hoddle mania continues in the West. People just FOMO cult into Bitcoin and do nothing but hodl it. And that just keeps going until this is worth trillions of dollars. And somebody like Jack Dorsey goes to Africa and spends time there actually living with people, talking to people there, and building the things that they can use and to actually funnel Bitcoin from the West into Africa. And that's how it'll happen. That's how it could happen. It's that there is something that uh, we might missing that uh, if if a country or if a geographic ter- territory actually starts to use Bitcoin, I believe then that territory is going to be the leader of the world because it just well we we have technological limitations, right? But assuming we have sound money and we build Bitcoin to a point where actually people can use it properly, then uh, then 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 that that regio is going to region is going to just work so much better and improve so much faster because the forty percent that that's how much the financial system is taking out of the economy right now is just going towards more productive things. So the point is that it doesn't really matter. Maybe maybe America would be able to to come down on Bitcoin, but who cares? Because America becomes uh, obsolete because other poor countries just start to improve more rapidly than than the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I would I would hate for things to go that way because I live here, but I completely agree with what Nopara just said. Yeah, and those are again if. You know, these are all ifs. And I don't agree. I mean, I do agree that that's how it could happen. Um, I just don't see, I see the likelihood of that low. But let's just say, let's just say, we, let's just say we don't know. I mean, we both have the arguments. But I think what going back to today, I think what matters is okay, we don't know if that's going to happen. It may happen for these reasons. It might not happen for these reasons. But let's just focus on 2020 and where we are today. So, what can we do? today to to get there if that's true what can we do today that has results that matter to us and this is where i see a problem is everyone says if this if that in the future meanwhile today they're they're paying their taxes they're buying their bitcoin on coinbase uh they're not spending the bitcoin because they don't want to get taxed that's the reality reality today and that's kind of what i'm focused on is like today well i mean i think there is a we can come to an agreement here because uh you you said there are ifs and for me the only if is and and this is an if if we can we can solve the technological limitations that bitcoin have today i think if we can solve them then we can then then it's inevitable adoption will inevitably take take care of itself if we cannot solve them then yeah i don't know that's all right, let me let me try it this way. Like I think the the, the fundamental gap here is just the, the perspective you're taking. Like the, the, the way I'm seeing or, or taken away from what we both said so far is you're concerned with actually laying the concrete right now so that we have somewhere to walk right now. I think that like people like me are more focused with we have to level that ground way up ahead or we're not even going to have anywhere to lay the concrete. And I think that those two different perspectives like ha- have that, that, that blind spot where things just don't compute when you, when you both try to come and look at something at that intersection. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, not, not quite. What do you, what do you mean? So I mean like, like I, like you're thinking like the here and now, like what can we do right now? And I'm thinking more what has to get laid out so that this is even possible 10 years from now. Because if if we don't consider that now, it's not going to be possible 10 years from now. Yeah. So what are those things that we need to do right now that uh, laying the groundwork 
or whatever the phrase is, the concrete. I mean, ultimately, just continue fundamental protocol improvements and developments of top layer protocols. I mean, it's just, it sucks, but like Bitcoin is not going to be easy to use for probably the next decade. And that's just how it is because so much of it just isn't built yet. And I mean, it is, as far as like trying to help people actually use it now, I mean, all you can do is, is just be there to help and hope that they're, you know, smart enough that they pick shit up fast. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's good. Um, like you said, I, I agree like 10 years, that sounds about right to me. Um, but again, I think this, I think this comes down to the state. I think it comes down to what's the power of the state. How powerful are they? How, how powerful aren't they? When are they going to step in and what are they going to do? And that's ultimately the battle because I, I can easily see Bitcoin continue to develop at the protocol level. That's obvious. Um, it will be easier to use. It's just what can the state do? I'm just thinking adversarially and in terms of likelihoods. And I think, oh. yeah, go ahead. Uh, so wait, so you think that if we succeed to build sound money that actually works uh, very well, then the state still have any chance to stop it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look at gold is a much better sound money in the US stop that in its tracks. I mean, the dollar is shit. But why is it dominant? Because the state is so powerful. And people say, well, Bitcoin is different. Well, it's different, but it doesn't mean the government can't can't squash it as, as well as it squash gold. There's different arguments why. But I just think that, I mean, just, just look at right now and what they can do. I, I just don't see how, how it's going to escape their mind that, oh, there's a sound money out there and they're going to be in a coma for 10 years and just be in a coma for 10 years as it happens. But see, that's the thing is like there, it's not like a singular group on a singular page and this is why i'm i'm like i am still kind of worried about the the threat the state could pose but not so much like my my read on the whole situation as far as governments go is they were imploding on themselves long before bitcoin showed up like just like the, the larger the government was the the more fractures in it we're building and i mean the the us you can see this in the most obvious case um with with marijuana legalization every state that legalizes marijuana is a state government looking at the federal government and going go fuck yourself uh we're gonna do what we want and that's not even the only issue they're doing that on right now like missouri last year passed a state law not only making federal gun restrictions illegal but actually making it a state crime for a federal agent to come into the state of missouri and attempt to enforce federal gun restrictions and the whole situation going on in virginia right now like long before bitcoin those cracks were showing and bitcoin has not even started like adding stress to those cracks yet yeah so for it to add those i mean definitely that's no disagreement in terms of uh, the state you know shooting itself in the foot and falling apart and it's likely that many fiats will collapse nothing to do with bitcoin at all but for that like i think the assumption is well for that for that to work um bitcoin would have to reach obviously a certain value and a, a certain level of adoption and if it reaches that price point and that adoption then it will be unstoppable and so that's the big if if that happens then this happens and, and so, so, so sorry to cut in real quick here but see this is the beauty of of kind of what's going on here right now all the superpowers of the world are looking at each other and they're sitting there thinking now if i actually help bitcoin happen how can that benefit me and how can that fuck you two over that is happening right now like they're already pulled into bitcoin's incentives and it hasn't even started causing the stress yet uh where is that happening because i i'm not aware of that other than russia supporting mining farms which is different than using Bitcoin as a weapon against the U.S. Well, there's difference. It's that supporting mining farms is supporting Bitcoin itself. And also like this, okay, like those mining farms are established fact. This is just speculation. But there have been numerous people 
on the edges of the Russian government talking about hinting at the, the Russian government outright buying Bitcoin. And like I said, their gold allocation dropped by half last year versus 2018. So like there. And then China, I mean, like China, like they, they have their boot over the neck. Like they, they just snap their fingers and they, they can start grabbing coins from whoever they want in that country. Like you, I don't think any big whale in China is going to hold up to Chinese torture um, and not give up those coins. So like China, they, they all they have to do is flip a switch and that's it. And the only saving grace about that situation is that um, all most of the mining equipment is up in remote mountains. So there's a chance if the Chinese government came down like that, that those people could just destroy all of that hardware so that it couldn't be used against Bitcoin. And maybe the fact that they're mining and holding is an incentive to do that. Yeah. Well, as we know, miners don't control the network. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is scale. So how much how much Bitcoin would Russia have to hold to be able to effectively um, attack the dollar in a meaningful way. They, they don't need to hold any, really. That's just them making sure they get something out of it. They build a stockpile and then they just flood fiat into Bitcoin, like just keep flooding. And eventually that arbitrage to other markets in the globe will pull them up too. And they have a stack of Bitcoin. So they're, they're gaining from this the whole time. And the bigger Bitcoin gets overall, the more it fucks with say the u.s yeah hypothetically but how much would they need first of all how much would they need to put into bitcoin and what would be the u.s's countermeasure to that i mean there, there's no countermeasure to that other than try to create capital controls so that you completely cut off like markets russians are pumping money into from american markets or you try to dump bitcoin down but you can't do that without bitcoin yeah so i wonder how much Again, how much money could they put into what it take to put into Bitcoin? I don't know. That's just an open question. But they're a you know federal government with superpower status and a money printer. Um, they they can just do it. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the U.S. government's you know ten hundred times more powerful than Russia with a lot more money and resources. But you know this is getting into hypotheticals, and so this goes back to if this happens and that and. I can see how most of these scenarios could happen if a bunch of other things happen. But, you know, this this is all great, but it goes back to let's focus on today and and think critically about numbers. Because, again, no one has put a number on it. How much Bitcoin does Russia need to own or how high does the price need to go of Bitcoin for that to happen? And there's no one can even put a ballpark on that. And then no one can come up with how is the U.S. government going to fight them? I mean, the, the U.S. government, we don't need to well, I mean, say how powerful they are. That, that's a, that you can't really perfectly quantify something like that because of all the variables interacting. But I mean, I think yeah. like the, the core thing here, Ragnar, is like you you seem very focused and intent on just staying in the here and now and doing that. And I think I think this maybe this this gap just can't be bridged because I'm just as focused on the the 10 years out and how to actually make that happen and like i i just i can't pull my focus away from that yeah and we need we need both i think it's not for me like yes i'm very focused on the here and now because that's the only thing you know we can only control what we do today where we spend our time but I'm also focused on thinking critically and adversary, adversarially about all these assumptions, you know, whether it's Russia or China, you know, whether there's adoption here or there. Those are the things I'm focused on in terms of the future and trying to apply the same rigor to those ideas as we do to code. And I'm not seeing that anywhere by anyone at all. I mean, I try to do that. It's just look at the probabilities. I mean, like I, I'm very confident Bitcoin is going to go a certain way, but I look at all the ways it could go. I don't just fixate on the one I think has the best chance and then ignore the others. And I mean, it's just, you have to think about it like that. Yeah. Like let's take hyper Bitcoinization, which is started out as sort of, I thought was a meme and now it's taken as a given. So how come no one is attacking hyper Bitcoinization and saying, okay, here's why this won't happen. 
here's all the ways it can't happen, or here's all the concrete steps that it takes to happen. That conversation doesn't happen at all. And you contrast that with, with, you know, the software with Bitcoin software is the opposite. Everyone attacks it. Everyone talks about why this is going to fail. And we've got to be conservative about this idea, set our expectations low. And these are the risks. And then it's like, completely opposite when we when we talk about hyper bitcoinization or we talk about you know china doing this or we we talk about uh africa or we talk about all those other things it's such a contrast and i mean why do you why do you think that is well it's i think it's because it's a simple binary thing bitcoin is going to fail or succeed and i think if it succeeds if it just continues existing successfully uh hyper bitcoinization is inevitable it's just a matter of how long does it take and so really that that question isn't really about hyper bitcoinization if you accept the the rational or the rationale of what that actually is it's a question over is bitcoin going to succeed or fail well see that's an assumption like it's there's no reason there's no evidence that it's binary first of all second of all if it is binary if we just play that that's that's a true assumption then how could that not happen what are the ways that it can't happen and i don't see anyone saying how it can't happen like explain well, the ways that hyper bitcoinization can't happen look at the the whole dynamic of the system um with proof of work the the difficulty adjustment and the halvening and how that that works into the incentives keeping the system going if bitcoin does not continue growing to the point where it's just a stable thing against goods and services. It's not there. The, the, the speculative component has completely become Bitcoin against goods and services. Then there's just too much speculative component to the price. And that gets unstable, that gets volatile. And if that spirals too far out of control like the whole system starts falling apart so if you don't have bitcoin reach that point then i think it's inevitably going to fall apart and fail so hyper bitcoinization is kind of intrinsically in my mind tied to bitcoin's success or failure like if that's not going to happen then i think bitcoin will inevitably fail yeah. can, can we can we close it on short and come to conclusions on everyone could articulate their position on that yeah, i think uh, this yeah i think I, I think we you know we gave this a good a good beating i think you know we, we understand where our differences are from but yeah i, I do kind of want to get into some guns uh, before I mean, we wind up eating up your whole we, morning we can agree on that if we are looking at infinite time frame then bitcoin is going to fail right because everything has to come to an end at one point mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess yeah. you know. So, um, you know, you, you already kind of gave us the uh, like the the little history and the kind of where it all started earlier. So, I guess you you kind of want to give a, a TLDR for people who aren't following guns and bitcoins, like kind of where things have come from there. Yeah, so before that, real quick, just just um, to to make sure I'm clear. It, to me, what I'm about is trying to apply the rigor of skepticism in terms of software code and adversarial thinking to these ideas that's that's all all i'm about and i don't see that happening with anyone at all period and when you do you get shit for it which is when i've been getting shit for it and that's the exact opposite culture people should be constantly talking about why hyper bitcoinization can fail why hype why bitcoin won't replace any fiat why the government will completely clamp down like to me that should be the conversation and it's the exact opposite. Like I'm just so surprised that I get so much shit for doing what software developers do every day when submitting code to the GitHub repository. That's that's my whole point. Like whether it's this topic or that, that's what I'm about. And I, I hope to see that change. I would love to see like a breaking Bitcoin conference, but for the ideas of Bitcoin hyper Bitcoinization or or anything else. That's if if you ask me what's my Christmas present, it would be a conference just on that. And I'll just cut myself off there mm -hmm. so um so 3d printed guns uh guns and bitcoin too long didn't read so that started like i said over a year ago but it actually started a couple of years ago during the um battle for activating segwit in 2017 
And it, it was the idea of, you know, UASF, which is similar to United States Air Force, USAF. And I think someone posted a, a photo of a gun in a hardware wallet, or maybe it was me, but either way, people posted a few. And that got me thinking about the uh, similarity between uh, guns and Bitcoin and how they kind of interact. And for me, uh, what guns and Bitcoin have in common is that they're both asymmetric defenses against the state. So you could be one person with a sniper rifle on a roof and you have a huge advantage over much more powerful adversaries. Um, same, you know, obviously with Bitcoin is asymmetric defense. So that's the too long didn't read of, of how I see those playing together, how Bitcoin can protect our financial sovereignty in a way and give us some autonomy and guns can do the same, but in meat space. And then from, from that kind of philosophy and ideas, I said, well, what can I do with this? And then we, our first product was the Scorpion case. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, what, what, what's kind of been like happening in, in that whole like community since the, the first liberator was made? Cause it's like, I've, you know, I've been trying to keep up with guns and Bitcoin and been following some people on Twitter and checking in on Keybase every once in a while. But it's like, I just, I don't have the, the time to, to dive into this like I do with Bitcoin. But like I, I've been seeing some crazy developments lately, like uh, completely plastic lower receivers, um, totally homemade um, barrels, which was one of the the difficult pieces to, to actually acquire cheaply or off is the radar. Is it me or Shinobi Katov? What was that? Nopara? Is, is it me or Shinobi Katov? But I can hear you. So Shinobi, are you here? Yes, I'm here. I think you just stopped talking. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll okay, yeah. So you were talking about the developments and and where it's and where it's gone. Yeah, this is another exciting thing about it is it reminds me of the earlier days of Bitcoin where there was kind of so much happening and things progressing so quickly and and also I would say um that's one thing. And the second thing is how decentralized it is. So going back to Cody Wilson and Defense Distributed back then it was basically them. And and that's why the State Department was able to kind of slow things down a bit because they simply went after defense distributed and Cody Wilson and they're still in court battling over it. But supposedly Trump is going to um, kind of uh, change that a little bit. But anyways, so current state is it's extremely decentralized in the sense there's a whole bunch of different guys um, doing designs and putting the plans out there. Um, so just to review the product, so that homemade barrel, yes. Yeah, so there's there's a way to make a rifled nine millimeter barrel at home, and that that's basically kind of electrochemical process. It's called electrochemical machining (ECM), which basically you put a steel rod inside of this solution, you hook it up to some electricity, and then it sort of eats away based on this. Uh, forgetting the word, but basically you you actually 3D print this part that has the pattern of the rifling and you stick that in and that basically is what gives the rifling pattern and and going taking this to bitcoin so this this guy named Ivan the troll adapted ECM for a 9 mm barrel and kind of made the process you know made straightforward and so someone created this bounty Actually, it was Ivan the Troll and another guy named Control P, who I'm interviewing at the Guns and Bitcoin podcast. But these two guys uh, put together a Bitcoin bounty that said, whoever can make one of these and show proof that they shot, you know, that, that they actually made it, win this Bitcoin bounty. And I think the Bitcoin bounty ended up being like $227, something like that. We submitted, we uh, donated $25 in Bitcoin to it. So this Bitcoin bounty caused, I think, three people to to do it. And then there was a winner. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so that's yeah, the barrel. That works. That That's fucking awesome. Yeah, they had a picture. So they showed the picture of the bullet and it had the rifling. They showed a picture of inside the barrel and you could see that the rifling pattern. Rifling is like a twist. So when the bullet exit, it's the bullet is mm -hmm. spinning and twisting. So for people who don't know. So that's a rifle. Um, there's a whole bunch of 3D printed frames, Glock frames, uh, Smith & Wesson frames, uh, high point frames. So the frames is like the thing that you hold, right? It's, it's sort of the grip. And then inside of the frame, you have where the magazine fits in and then you have the trigger. And then the thing on top is the slide. But, but that frame is the base of everything. And so there's a whole bunch of those, like I said, Glock, Smith & Wesson, uh, High Point, and, and some others. 
And what's important about that is that in most places, that is considered the firearm. That is where there's a serial number. That's the thing they get that gets registered. So if you have a 3D printed frame, then you have technically a gun that is not uh, registered. And it's perfectly legal as long as you don't sell it and as long as you're not a, a person who can't own firearms, you know, like a, a criminal or something. So if you're just a regular person and you don't sell it or distribute it, then you can have this um, gun that, that's not on any government registry. So that's the key about that particular part being 3D printed. Mm -hmm. And, so, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say... Um, like, you know, one thing I kind of wanted to, to get into a bit on that specifically is, is something I've seen is a, a few claims of like actual design flaws in mass manufactured um, weapons of different styles that have actually been fixed uh, by people in this, this community. So you actually not just have uh, people like creating printable versions of existing things, but actually improving and, and removing design flaws from the originals. Well, I don't think that manufacturers have changed anything, but definitely some of the designs have improved things in some cases. And this is because you can iterate so fast and do things differently when it's so cheap to just make three different versions of the same frame, then you, you can make it better. So that's that's really fascinating and also shows the decentralization that different people try different ways. That's one thing. Another thing that's been improved upon is all the the DIY guns that were that came before 3D printing. So there's something called the the Ludi, which was it's a gun that you can make at home using like a lathe and a drill press and different metal working parts and you have to buy things from like a hardware store. So it's it's a DIY gun. Nothing to do with 3D gun printing. And it's actually kind of hard to make, especially the magazine. But what these guys have done is adapted that to 3D gun printing where you can print a lot of the parts. And then um, and by doing so and doing things a little bit differently besides the, the printed parts, that Ludi now is, is actually works better than the original. And uh, this is called the FGC-9, the Fuck Gun Control 9 millimeter. And so people can Google that at FGC-9. And we interviewed the kind of the main developer behind that on the on the podcast. His name is Jay Stark 1809 So that DIY weapon was improved. Um, so to answer your question on that mm -hmm. and other things and other things. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy. You know, like looking at this kind of stuff, it has me wondering, like, if, if this isn't just sweepingly declared illegal on the federal level or something like are we going to see open source gun communities with contributors from gun manufacturers in 10 years oh yeah so some, some people think that gun manufacturers will start putting things out in parts instead of you buy the whole gun they will sell you parts because like the the like the barrel, most barrels are still really hard to make. So you might see Glock say, all right, you guys are making your own frames, but we'll give you the, the kit parts or something. So that's one way that can happen. Or just the feedback loop, the, the manufacturers will say, we're going to do it differently. Or they will be mass 3D gun printers. I mean, they could say, send in your files. We have uh, the, the shop it up, both maybe a, a CNC you know, a metal printer and a, you know, a plastic printer and you send in your file and then they make it and then they ship it to your firearms and then you pick it up. So yeah, it could be this whole weird new dynamic of distributed manufacturing of traditional manufacturers. You buy some parts, you make other parts, you put them together. I mean, it's just going to be a bunch of Frankenstein guns done, you know, a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, it just, it blows my mind because it's like we, we've seen in, in the past like 30 years, open source just eats the software world. But we've never really seen that attitude kind of translate into any other aspect of society or hobby or thing or, or, or field. And it, it's just crazy to me looking that the guns – <laughs> might be that that second big thing to get eaten like that. Oh, absolutely. That's what's exciting about it because you see the same trends open source, 
eat, eating away. You, you get these tinkerers and these hobbyists who are improving things. And then like these guys are saying, like, why would you pay $600 for a Glock when you can effectively make it for, you know, 150, maybe 200 between the parts and everything else. Maybe a Glock's more like three, 300. But they made this other pistol called a High Point, and the total was, I think, like $80. So that's crazy. <laughs> and and so yeah you're exactly right with the open source eating closed source and it also lowers the barrier for poor people so guns cost money and they can be expensive so the cheaper it is to have a gun that that expands the right to bear arms just by lowering that financial barrier mm-hmm. oh, man. and you know i think i think uh you know i i did bring up the the plastic lower receivers so uh kind of a jump uh point here you know, I've, two things on that that I've seen are some with uh, for the AR-15, but I've also been seeing lately the the Plastikov, and oh, yeah. that that just like instantly in my mind uh, jumped to the Cryptonomicon. Uh, oh yes, yeah. a, a V and the the Holocaust prevention uh, plan that he had, which which a lot of it was like just being able to build weapons at home yourself when the next Nazis take over in your home. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the plastic. So that's it's a AK forty seven, and by Ivan the Troll, which is so funny because he's Ivan is printing uh, AK forty seven. So he printed yeah the, the upper receiver for it, and it works. At first it broke. So at first it broke apart, and then he he modified it. He had some he added some more. I think plastic to it and you'd use some fiberglass at least to reinforce it in a broke again and then he he went back and just kind of redesigned it with more reinforcement and now it works and i think he's put at least 500 rounds through it without breaking and everyone said you'll never be able to print that because of you know the pressures of it's a rifle round right seven seven six two is pretty mm-hmm. it's a lot of pressure it's not a nine millimeter and so people said ah you'll never be able to do that and then he did it yeah, and I mean, so it's, and, it's so and, crazy. Yeah, and you, and we know that the AK-47 and variants are the most common rifle in the world. So hey, if you could print, you know, one part and you can get these other parts somewhere else. I mean, they're ubiquitous. That becomes more of an international thing whereas right now 3D gun printing is, you know, mostly in the US. Mm-hmm, but even just period, just like the fact that so much of that that that, that piece can be made out of plastic. And I mean 500 rounds even if it breaks on the the 501st round, if it, if it's designed so it doesn't just literally explode and hit you in the face, um, that's really good. That is way better than nothing. If if you have the the newly formed Gestapo knocking on your door one day, yeah, that's a great point, and and, and that shows like the real usage of guns. What it's really meant for ultimately is protection against the state. And I keep, I hate to keep plugging our podcast, but we did an episode, uh, (laughs) I'll be shameless. So we did an episode with a guy named Jeff Kelman, and he's a master's student. He's Jewish, and he's doing his master's thesis on the role of gun control and the Holocaust and on multiple genocides. And in that episode, we go through the Holocaust, we go through, you know, China, we go through, um, uh, what's, what's the country in, in Africa, uh, all these different genocides. And we talk Rwanda. about the role of, yeah. Yeah. And and then we talk about the role of gun control in those countries. And then we ask the question, well, what if these people were able to print their guns? You know, maybe it would have turned out differently. Maybe not. Maybe they still would have got slaughtered, but at least they would have had the option. And so, yeah, like V that's kind of, kind of the the big picture goal it's not just for hobbyists to make these cool guns and shoot it but to really you know use that open source to upend things and, and shift that power balance mm-hmm. like th- that episode was, was fascinating just with like how like brutally realistic you were with everything yeah that, that and and he actually knows the stuff like you know gun owners we all like to say uh you, you know talk about guns and the government but like he actually had hard numbers for it and this has a parallel to bitcoin of, of being able to seize bitcoin being able to seize guns um you know bitcoin has its strengths because it's it's harder to seize it's not impossible to hit people with a, a five dollar wrench 
but it does prevent a lot of seizure. And so what's same with these guns, if it's unserialized, if you didn't buy it at a store, if it's not on record, it's harder for them to knock on your door and say, hey, we had this list of guns you own, you got to give them up because mm -hmm. they don't know about the three that you made that are you know, in your backyard. They, they don't even look because they said, okay, here's the list of guns. Yep, that covers it. Thanks. Have a nice day, sir. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's just like, Bitcoin like breathe the new breath of life or fresh air into the lungs of just cypherpunks and that philosophy. But like these fucking like the, this 3D printing gun communities out there, they're they're building armies. You know, it's it's a little I I, I cannot put on guns in Bitcoin without just thinking about a Vive or a V from a um, Cryptonomicon because it's like that 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 whole book like for for people who haven't read it is that like the the 90s idea of the 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 cyber cypherpunk future like a e-cash e bank was a whole plot point but you know again like so was this idea of just being able to make a gun yourself when your government goes crazy and starts acting like fascists yeah, that I love that book. I mean, it's it's like 400 pages too long, but it's still worth it. it, it yeah, and how prescient it was. Yeah, 90s, right? I think it was released. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so this is going back to, yeah, guns and Bitcoin. This is why I see the combination of both. There's so many parallels, both in, in what they can do, but their development over time and how Bitcoin helps 3D gun printing and, and hopefully the other way around. And actually, um, not... Nick Zabo said something the other day. He said, um, what was it that he was commenting on? But he said, physical security is part of protecting your your private keys, referring yep. to a gun post. Did you see that one? Mm -hmm. So people are, people are, people understand this. Um, it's another topic that gets people riled up too. That's why I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, kind of, kind of spitball for a bit here. Cause you know, I've, I've started seeing, you know, like the, uh, I forget what type of gun it's called, but the giant two-man over-the-shoulder duck gun that's completely illegal in the, the UK. Uh, what the hell is it called? Oh, I don't know. But um, duck yeah, it's, 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 I saw somebody post a meme about that, and one of the guys from uh, one of the, the gun communities just like when 3D printed, <laughs> it, it just got me thinking. Like, wow. you know, how, how far long? can it go? Yeah, like how long until, you know, people take this to just completely designing whole new types of, of weapons from scratch, like not even guns or like powder, um, like fueled projectiles, like just literally, we're just going to sit down and invent a completely new type of weapon. Yeah, it's, it's starting to happen around the edges. So I mentioned the smokeless powder that someone in Hong Kong had made. We did another podcast with a guy named Austin Jones. His his company, well, it's a nonprofit, is Atlas Arms, and they're developing an armor penetrating bullet mm -hmm. that will be legal according to the law. And it's interesting because it's actually your bullets are either meant to expand, right, in in the body, or they're meant to pierce. Like if you're going to hunt, you want it to pierce the hide of the bear or the the um the deer but bullets are made to do both you either have to pierce or expand but his bullet would do both first it would pierce the armor and then it would expand so he's creating a new type of just bullet design with these exotic rare earth metals so you have that and then i saw um a guy who had made a, a 50 caliber gun if you just if you just search it like 0 0.50 I think his name is like Fat Tony or Ugly Tony or some some funny name. Like, so he had created this gun around the 50 caliber, which no one thought they were gonna do. And then you have a couple of variants of shotguns. Um, and and I think it will be a combination of using parts like off-the-shelf parts in existing ways, along with 3D gun printing, like the FGC9. That's a hybrid gun where you make the barrel, you make the magazine, you use airsoft parts for the trigger group, you print the receiver, and I know I'm probably missing some stuff, but yeah. And I even saw a, a 3D printed Claymore mine, which is a you know it's a mine that when you basically it explodes forwards. So people just created a, a mine and then you put like a get gunpowder and some other things. So yeah, this is definitely going to create new, whole new types of weapons. And then when you're talking about 
like electronic ignition of bullets. So instead of having to use powder, it just uses electricity to spark, uh, you know, the combustion of, yeah. And then, and then when you combine that with drones, I mean, we can go crazy with this stuff, especially when you start talking about drones. Oh yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm going to just do it. Um, you know, I, I've literally for like the past three years or something been wondering um how has no psychopath realized out there that he could get a little arduino stick a wire in an m80 and have an electronic trigger and a little m80 on a 20 dollar drone maybe someone has maybe you'll be first person to do it Oh, I'm I not mean, doing that. <laughs> I'm not touching that one with a ten foot yeah. pole. <laughs> yeah, no, but there, there have been. I saw this guy. He had, um, he made this thing where it's like, I don't know if you want to call it a turret. I'm missing my words right now, but it's basically it's it's this gun that automatically shoots. It has this a motion sensor, and he used like airsoft, you know, um, paintball, and he had a paintball gun, and he set it up on like this turret, and it had motion detectors, and he was running around his backyard getting shot with this paintball gun, and it was like 95% accuracy. He'd jump, he'd lay down, he'd move, and it would shoot him. So replace the air, you know, the paintball gun with the real gun, and. There you That's go. It's a highly illegal home security system. Very, very illegal. Don't try this at home. But it is a proof of concept. And then, of course, they've done similar things with drones, which should also be illegal. And I think that's one reason why the, um, what is it, the F FAA wants to have all drones registered because I think they figured out that people are eventually going to do these kind of crazy nutball things with drones as well. Um, and who was it that said, I think it was, um, either Naval or, or someone said that it's going to be drones that really kind of change the power dynamics when it comes to weapons. I think there'll be a big part of it, but like the FAA is delusional. I mean, you can just build it yourself or just reprogram and flash anything with IDs tied to it. Yeah. If you can make it at home or, or what if you just buy a, a drone on Craigslist from some guy? I mean, unless they have a, a gun type registry where you have to go through a drone dealer, which I guess maybe it's possible. But yeah, I, it's another thing that's going to be harder to stop. Not impossible, but just um, harder. Yeah. I mean, you know, have you ever read The, the Sovereign Individual? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I have it this... on my book book bookshelf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it should be required reading in this space. But I mean, like this, this is, I think, the first real phases of that, um, that book's thesis starting to play out as terms as the, the force projection side, because like the, the two, two of the, the core aspects of the, the thesis was digital um, secure money uh, being a huge stress to governments financing themselves. And then the other was the, the, the price of being able to project force getting cheaper and more widely available. Also just changing the ability of governments to actually enforce things um, with physical violence. And like, yeah. this is, this is absolutely that playing out before our eyes. Yeah. And, and going back to scale, because we were talking about scale earlier with Bitcoin, I think that's also important. And could 3D printed guns defeat a nation state? I'm not so sure, but it's about the balance, like you said. And a good example of deterrence and scale is the Bundy Ranch standoff. I don't know if you're familiar yes. with that. Yes, yeah. I am. Yeah. So it was basically for people who don't know, it was basically these ranchers who had been grazing on federal land for generations, but they had never paid some tax or permit to, to do so. And so finally, you know, went to court back and forth. And then I guess the BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management, won the lawsuit and, and went to, you know, shut them down. I think it was collect their cattle. And then there was a standoff between the, the family and a bunch of militia members came from various states, just kind of individuals who'd been following it. And there was a standoff and it was, I don't know, maybe 50 guys who were armed. And so they had like the FBI, they had, I think it was like the state police and maybe, you know, different federal law enforcement agencies in the standoff against these guys. And the federal government could have, you know, killed them all probably within a minute or two, but just, you know, they didn't, right? They, the federal government went home and effectively the Bundy family sort of won in a way. So the feds went away despite having overwhelming force and resources. 
And it wasn't because they won the battle, but they, there was just sufficient deterrence there. And you were talking about the costs. And it wasn't a financial cost that the federal government was facing. It was like the PR cost, mm -hmm. the cost the legitimacy of legitimacy in people's eyes. Yeah. So if you can spread these things to even another couple percentage points, and then they can use that as currency, that might be just enough at certain scales in certain circumstances to help you know certain people. And that might be enough. And th that to me goes back to Bitcoin too. Like to me, I just think a nation state is tough, but I think if you can just do it among your own little village, like I think of the Amish, um, like the Amish are somewhat self-sovereign or you think of the Muslim communities in Western Europe, they're somewhat self-sovereign. Like they kind of are left alone and they have just enough sovereignty to kind of do things the way they want, but not obviously complete. And that's kind of what I see with, with Bitcoin and with, with guns. Just trying to think on more of that scale and not all or nothing sovereignty, um, but just it's absolutely. Approved, I guess. See, like, you know, to, to kind of tie back a little bit to what we were saying in Bitcoin, like that is absolutely why I am so confident personally things will play out to take Bitcoin up to that scale because everything about the world around us in, in my mind is just screaming everything is – localizing like all of these these big state players that could potentially throw their weight around and try to disrupt bitcoin as a system like just everywhere people is pulling away from them ignoring them resisting them more like i don't think they're gonna be powerful enough to for much longer well i think that's the key is localism and that's more what i'm focused on is localism and so could a country adopt Bitcoin as reserve currency or their currency? I think if that ever happens, it will be a small island state um, catering to, you know, like the hedge fund crowd, uh, better privacy banking laws, stuff like that. And that's a very small scale. But for people who live in that island nation or for people who use banks on that island nation, hey, it works for them. It's not mass adoption, but it it works for them. It's Here's the beauty of that, though, Ragnar, is that one island nation can serve anybody in the world because all of this is purely digital and global. And when that one island nation does it, five others are going to do it when they see how fucking much their economy is booming after that. And then some bigger states will start doing it and it'll domino. Maybe, but like if we see like in the Caribbean, when we see these countries that have these these banking regulations like Bermuda and um, you know, the other ones in the Caribbean and even Panama that hasn't really spread outside of them. They're kind of in a, in a unique niche and you still, there's still plenty of barriers, but it is at least an alternative. And Hey, maybe that'll spread. Hey, I, I actually hope everything we've talked about happens. Here's the difference so. there though, is with Bitcoin, most of those barriers are gone because most of those barriers are getting money in and out of the, the safe haven banks in the Caribbean. You don't have that problem with Bitcoin. Snap, I push a transaction. Yeah, in theory, but if you're in the US, I mean, look at why has the US been able to break Switzerland's banking privacy after they've held it for centuries? And why don't a lot of US people are able to use, you know, these Swiss banking. It's because the U.S. Is, is powerful enough. Now, maybe other countries can use it because they don't have the same, uh, you know, they're not under the thumb of the U.S. So I, I think of it as just it's kind of a person specific, country specific kind of thing. And I think that's OK. And I think that's what we should work towards is let's just start on a local level and then maybe it will spread. To your specific question of why the U.S. was able, it's because the privacy was not architectural it was confidentiality, right? If the privacy is architectural, that's, you can't break that. Mm -hmm. But yes, but considering almost everyone buys their Bitcoin on exchanges and probably will for the long foreseeable future and keep their Bitcoin on exchanges. But it's then... like, think about this, Ragnar. If I deposit Bitcoin into the magic Swiss Bitcoin bank in a way where they just condense that output and credit some accounts and can't tie the actual Bitcoin to those accounts, then I just I just cleaned those coins from any surveillance point of view. The bank doesn't know which one's tied to that. They just know when some guy gives them a crypto proof that they owe him some money. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's scale though. I mean, look at what like we already have some ways to have improved privacy with Bitcoin, of course, but how many people are are using it? Like very few. So it's it's scale. How many people can do it? Is it possible? Yes. Is it possible now? Yes. But it just comes down to scale. And I'm okay with a small scale. Like I actually think we're better off if if we sort of fly under the radar a little bit to not provoke a head-on attack and just slowly, locally, small scale do it so that the people who want to do it can. I mean, everyone uses Facebook and Google despite what they know that they shouldn't. It's just because it's convenient. <laughs> Like, look, at most of us here, like we're willing to put up with the technical hurdles and the difficulty and the risks of everything else. But, you know, most most people aren't that. So maybe I'm just more pessimistic, pessimistic on the human race than than other people. <laughs> well, and I also think it makes more sense to focus on local stuff because your chance of actually succeeding there and for having that having that or where that success is actually going to last is much higher than trying to affect things on a global scale with multiple different cultures competing against each other and having miscommunication and stuff. It's much more likely that you're going to get resilience focusing on what you know and what's around you than than trying to adjust, like address a, ge a geopolitical map. Um, like that just... That, that's why I see like like all of this being related to self sovereignty because you know I my goal whether I like I honestly don't care very much whether hyper Bitcoinization happens or not because the primary goal is personal sovereignty and that comes down to people choosing to you know start rebuilding their lives in ways that they're resilient whether or not the global financial system collapses because i think they should just do that anyway it's valuable to be it's valuable to have that kind of lifestyle regardless of whether things collapse around you or not like ideally things shouldn't have to collapse you should just choose it because it at the, at the end of the day it's just better yeah i agree and if you look at the communities that have lasted um the, the sort of semi self sovereign communities it's the small ones it's the mennonites it's the amish now it's the muslim communities in western europe it was the mormons for a while in the 19th century that's a little bit differently but they weren't you know they were able to be self sovereign because they were small and very uh united and tight and intertwined um you know these these communities everything is you got the economics there the commerce you've got social activities you've got uh their beliefs you've got everything and so th they are the only examples that i'm aware of that have actually been able to be self-sovereign and it's required a community like the, the only flaw with the sovereign individual book i think is it underestimates a little bit the need for community and libertarians do that as well but like what what you said is absolutely the thing is people should do it anyways and think local and like a local bitcoin meetup is like the node of bitcoin and that's where people can buy and sell bitcoin and try to build you know go from there i think yeah that's that's another thing that i've noticed too and for the past couple of years i've been thinking like you know there there's more to there's there's more to being having sovereignty than just being independent like you you should like in order to be tr truly resilient you have to have other people around you and then um uh, someone gave me, I've never read it, but it's like this kind of cliche uh, uh, self-help book now, the Seven Habits book. And that's one of the points he makes about, you know, everyone starts in the stage of dependency. They have to move to independence, um, but independence shouldn't be the end goal. The end goal is interdependence where you're able to use the skills that you have as an independent person to benefit other people and share you know, share the benefits of all of that because you're stronger together as a group. And I think, yeah, that's definitely something that a lot of people haven't figured out yet. Yeah, absolutely. Because when we think of Bitcoin and self sovereignty, we just think of, oh, I've got my Bitcoin um, in cold storage and no one can steal it from me and I could send a transaction and no one can stop me from doing that. But it's not very effective if you're not in a community. Like I think of a, a dumb example is let's say I live in a small town of 200 people and we only accept cash for everything. Like I buy donuts with cash. So yeah, with, with that, I was just saying that um, Janine was, was talking about um, the need for interdependence. The independence is just starting point and you actually need a you know, community of people depending on each other and working together. And I was just saying for a self-sovereign community, 
I could see a town of 200 where they'll only accept cash and, and you have everything you need, a mechanic shop, a bakery, uh, you know, school teachers, lawyers. And if everyone accept, accepts cash and cash only, you're not subject to the surveillance and to the censorship and taxes are harder to pay if everyone uses cash. So that just was to her point about having interdependence that in itself is so powerful, a, a true community. And it goes back to what I'm saying about the big economy is if you get it just that scale, it doesn't change the world, but you know, the people in that economy, it, it certainly helps, you know, you're still living under a state, but you know, you're, you're a lot more autonomous than other people. Yeah. And you know, the, the thing about that though, is like that, that's one scope and the, the, the global level is another scope. And so, you know, one thing happening at that global scope can be the make or break difference as to whether only a small subset of people can do little self-sovereign communities like that, or everybody can just break into communities like that. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Cause I mean like that, that this is kind of the whole like interplay uh, I'm saying is, is important to, to recognize when you had people like me or like others in the space who are more concerned with like that, that big global level is things going right on that level means that everybody at the, the smaller level can organize like that instead of just the, the few lucky groups that are tight enough and in the right place, they can get away with that. Yeah. Hope, hopefully. I mean, that's, that's possible. My, my view of humans and just looking at history is most people do what's easiest for themselves and that most people aren't in a very tight knit community who can organize sufficiently at a, at a level to achieve that. But, you know, maybe technology will change that. I mean, Zabo talks about the social scalability of Bitcoin versus the social scalability of traditional finance. And that's his thesis in that article is Bitcoin is socially scalable because it removes, you know, these human elements. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I think, you know, I think, I think that there, there's these two things or like two scales of looking at things are really a lot more interconnected. And I think, I don't know, it's just, I, I think if, if people recognize like which scope they're trying to come at things from, like there, there's a lot more agreement and in common there, I think, than like not recognizing that different starting point. Yeah, to me, it's two two things that I've been focusing on and I'm going to keep harping on it uh, on Twitter, unfortunately for everyone is scale and <laughs> is scale but i think more importantly is is critical thinking and adversarial thinking against all of these things because there's no downside to it other than we don't get to feel elated and uh inevitably successful because then we can attack it and say okay well shoot this could happen well let's just you know develop this writing software that has this improvement uh for peer to peer transactions just hammering it what can go wrong why isn't this true why won't this happen what are the steps oh these are the steps okay let's work on those so there's no downside to this i'm just it's more it's so weird there's this weird bipolar thing in bitcoin where the developers are so harsh on the code but in terms of the, the ideas and the concepts just get kind of a free pass it's just really bipolar that that's kind of what i'm confused by yeah, I, I can I can kind of agree with you there. I I feel the same way, but about a lot of different things in in that aspect of stuff. Yeah, well, you're a good example. You're you're so skeptical and and intelligent and see the holes in things, and but also so balanced. Like this, like the different conflicts, but I won't be specific about you've seen both sides, and you kind of push back when one side is going too far. You present both. Like that's more of what we need. And the, and the, and when they don't agree with him, he he breaks up swear <laughs> words. <laughs> Which is you important. Don't need more of Shinobi. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I, this is the first time I've said, uh, or first time I've heard someone refer to Shinobi as balanced. <laughs> A well-rounded <laughs> vocabulary includes lots of profanity. Yes. Well, maybe I was comparing him to myself, so it's not that hard to be. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's easier compared to me, but no, he, from my point of view, he, he is when you look at different topics, 
uh, I've heard him give more two sides than other people have given two sides. Now, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed that I haven't caused him to curse at me yet. So I'll, I'll have to think of something. Either I'm not saying dumb things enough or smart things enough for him to get upset. So I, I don't know why I haven't. I can, I can give you I can give you the secret recipe. Talk to him about nation states oh, yeah. <laughs> and whether and borders are legitimate. <laughs> oh, I think I saw something. I'll try that because I have very strong feelings on that. So I'm afraid oh, we're on the same you, page. You, 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 you and too. I might be uh, might be tag teaming on the same side of a debate soon, Ragnarly. Uh, I, well, let me ask you this: Are you on the same side as Giacomo or the opposite, opposite. side? Opposite. Opposite. Okay, then yeah, then Shinobi and I are on the same uh-huh. same side. I think I think Zabo's on our side too. So that's three out of we got three. We just need two more. I don't philosophically recognize a difference between borders and property lines beyond the scope and time scales and like how ownership is handled. Yeah, my my approach is I'm always try to be practical. My approach is I have a responsibility for my life to make it as as peaceful and prosperous and happy as possible and defend myself and more importantly my family and third my friends and so anything that threatens our safety security way of life happiness anything i don't care where it comes from i'm going to defend against that whether it be anything and so when it comes to to borders i have seen in my own life in my own family the uh bad effects of the emission we've had so to me that's the question of of national borders of hey does having a border make my family safer more prosperous where we can control who's coming in and out yes then i support it i, I don't get too deep into the philosophy i'm, I'm a practical person uh, i will i will wax that philosophy all day <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think I think uh, philosophy can be influenced by obviously your life experience. And so the more bad things you've seen, I think the more, I think you could usually tell people who have seen a lot of really shitty things, because when you get into the philosophy, you realize that hmm, this person may not have experienced certain, certain things because if they had, they, they might think otherwise. Look, since we opened the can of worms, let's think about it like this. Uh, this is going to be a massive episode. Um, so if, if you have a, a piece of property with your property delineated that you acquired either through your legitimate labor or voluntarily without theft of any kind, and that, that property boundary is legitimate, then why is a boundary around a whole group of people's property that was all like voluntarily acquired and this Which has never boundary happened. voluntarily yeah. established, why is that not just as legitimate as one person's property line? Because the, board, the borders that we're referring to have never been acquired in that way, and that's why I have a disagreement with that. Well, then you can make the exact same a the- claim about a the- property. Um, all property um, eventually down the line was stolen. Done. No, I, I mean, we've had, oh God, the, we've had this debate. I don't want to, ha- I don't, we've had this debate twice and it's ended really badly because, um, one side of the debate cannot control their anger. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and yeah, so no, there, there is a very, I see a very big divide philosophically between the two because one, it's not even about going back in history and like the historical versions of the property line of the border it's the current incarnation of the border and how that was built and acquired. And I don't, I very, I've, it's when you're talking about maybe Island nations, that is, and, and they haven't been, you know, colonized or whatever. I would say that's probably the only instance where you can say a border was established by a community where it wasn't stolen or whatever. But most, most borders today were not established that way. Well, no and then property you have to, and then, in existence and then, in whole parts of the world was acquired without murdering people and stealing it. it yes, th- there's plenty of property, like individual property that was acquired that way. But the biggest, the, the, the only, I can understand why, like, Ragnar, why you have that perspective. Um, I don't disagree with it. Um, the only thing is, I'm also thinking about why 
why do people see the border as being necessary? Why, where did the danger come in the first place? Like I get the practical response to why it's being justified, but in terms of like looking at the root cause of why does that danger exist in the first place and who's responsible for it? I think that that's a more important question. Why should this, should this border exist or not? Or how should this border exist? And what do you think is that where the danger comes from? Or the uh, reason? Well, I mean, if if we're talking about a particular border um, with the United States, uh, a lot of the violence and conflict that has led to a migration, well, one, a degradation of the, you know, economic and social situation, and then the resulting migration to what people see as a more stable situation, a lot of that has to do with, with um, powerful actors who are not native to that country and have, you know, ex essentially exploited that region. And in fact, a lot of the border area used to belong to people that live in the region who are now trying to migrate to an area that their ancestors used to live in. Um, so I'm just looking at it from like a historical, historical perspective about why does this violence exist? And is this the is this the best response we can have to solving those problems of violence? Yeah, like ending the drug war would go a long way. I mean, that would that would help, and that's that's a function yeah. of the state. No, um, it wouldn't. Though. Yeah, for, like see that that's a meme that completely does not understand the the, the cartels down there in that country. Like they're they're not just drug cartels. Like they. They are in the logging industry. They are literally partners in oil fields, getting into the oil industry. Like you're not going to stop them just because you legalize drugs. Like they're already well, diversified yeah, into a million things. I, I don't – well, part of the problem is because we haven't thought – because enough people haven't thought about the source of the issue, they've tried to address the symptoms – it's now we're in a situation where it's too far gone to just say we're going to legalize drugs and that that won't that will not fix the situation because we've left it too long. It's become now embedded in those areas that it will take a lot more work to dismantle that. So no, that I don't I don't believe that, but I do think that the drug war has and the United States government's role in the drug war, which is not benevolent, um, that has that has done a significant a significant responsibility in the issue well i go even farther than that i just look at uh like shinobi was talking about the cartels and what they've gotten into that, that's exactly it i think humans will always be violent they'll always figure out ways to use force and come together and do all sorts of various things and so for me a border is hey, we're always going to need a border, whether it's a tiny town or nation state or whatever it is you want to you wanna make it because people will always try to come and steal your stuff, invade you, take your oil, sell drugs, whatever it be. So that's my stance is we always need borders, just at different, different, different scales and by different entities. And even if we don't agree with the entity building the border, hey, if it keeps me safe, then I'm going to have to support that. Yeah, it depends on which side of the border you are. <laughs> yeah, well, I I'm only on one side of the border, so that's that's the side that I can I can defend. I just think it's like people again, like it's the philosophy versus the instantiation. Like there there's nothing inherently illegitimate about a border. You just have a problem with specific borders that were set up illegitimately. Like there's absolutely nothing inherently immoral or wrong with a government like people just have problems with specific governments that have stepped as past a, their purpose as a as a voluntarist i have to absolutely disagree about that but i don't think we're gonna like again i'm i probably actually agree more with ragnar than with you and this might be the disagreement is that the argument i was made with shinobi was that scale matters when you ha like we were talking about localism mattering when you have a community of 200 people 2000 people even 20,000 when you're trying if you're if you want to establish some kind of boundary line around that that is like a, on a completely different level than trying to establish a boundary line around 300 million people most of which have 
already split like there's a reason we have the left the left coast and the west coast or the the left coast and the east coast and all of these different regions is because this country is or well not i'm not even in this country <laughs> the, the united states is um it's it's like it's the reason why i would argue the that's the reason states are able to make these decisions about whether they should legalize drugs or not is because at the end of the day states have more power because they're more directly accountable to their own population than a nationwide government ever will be in any any scenario so that's the difference i see is when you're talking about a border around a small group of people who they don't have to know each other face to face but they could in some context, whereas 300 million people are, you just, you, it would be too hard to, to establish any kind of boundary on a voluntary basis at that scale. And that's, that's, that's where I stand on the issue. So that doesn't make it illegitimate if it's accomplished. That doesn't make it inherently illegitimate. If people at the, the I, 20,000 people level and so do that. I see and voluntary then, action as legitimate action. If it's, if it's again, using like, violence, Janine, I see that as illegitimate. Nothing about a government or border implies not being voluntary. And it's absolutely legitimate and justified to use violence to defend a legitimate border. I am 100% morally justified in using force to defend my property and that line around that property. And so are people who collectively define that line around their collective property. Yes. And I, I bet all of the people who we, you know, currently call Mexicans, but actually used to live in large chunks of what we now call the United States were defending their property and they lost. And because they lost, we take the perspective of most historians, which, which is the victor's uh, write history, they make the rules. And so we see it as legitimate now because we're living in the present and we are part of the victors and they are not. But see, again, now you're trying to make the argument that because property was stolen back down through the line in history, it's not legitimate. No, I see it as legitimate because it was established on the basis of horrific, horrific violence. And because it was stolen. It was stolen. It was established on the basis of horrific violence. And I'm a voluntarist. And so my philosophical perspective, regardless of whether I think practical reasons for doing something are reasonable, my philosophical perspective is that voluntary action is legitimate. Violence, instigating violence against others who have not done so against yourself is illegitimate. That's just my stance as a voluntarist. That doesn't contradict anything I just said. It does, and that's that's why we don't have the same perspective about that. Uh, how does saying you are justified in using force to defend your property contradict anything you just said? Because you are you're you're, you're saying yes. Could a theoretical state exist where the border was not established on theft and violence? And I'm saying I don't think that's po as i've said before many times say the word scale many times at the scale of a country i don't think that's practically possible i don't at the scale of the united states i don't think it's practically possible therefore i don't think it's legitimate that's not okay let, let, let's just move on so uh, i guess ragnar uh anything else you might uh to bring up <laughs> this is going to be a massive fucking episode um, so we've talked about guns and Bitcoin. We've talked about Bitcoin circular economy. Uh, we've talked about critical thinking, adversarial thinking. Um, so let's, uh, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd want to end with, and thanks for, for letting me come on and talk with you guys. Um, I love having my brain stimulated. It's, this is like a rare chance to have intelligent conversation. So I guess to, to maybe wrap up, is is how can we maybe this is just me but how can we bring more skepticism and critical thinking into the stuff we've talked about hyper bitcoinization everything we've talked about claims that uh we could starve the nation state of taxes to fund wars which we didn't get into um is that something you guys want to see do you think or do you think it's not a problem no, I think it's absolutely healthy to be skeptical of those things. And I mean, just follow things down the rabbit hole. 
I mean, like you want to look at, you know, the ability to defund the government. Okay. I'm pretty sure how many employees the IRS has is public. Like how many potential users of Bitcoin are there? Like how heavily would they have to prioritize all of their employees on the Bitcoin users um, to get a decent percentage of those? Like how does that change depending on how many people theoretically own Bitcoin? Like you, you can crunch the numbers and, and, you know, run napkin math analysis on something like that. You know, I mean, just like put forward things like that. I mean, like, you know, if, like think a specific thing like that, like think about how do we actually to some degree quantify it you know like that that example there's going to be a huge margin of error dependent on the assumptions you make but like it's a starting point and you just a tackle an issue at a time like that yeah that's exactly my approach is say okay if we can starve the nation state of enough taxes to where they can't wage war or at least not for extended periods of time that's an extraordinary claim so someone's got to come up with a ballpark and start with numbers because it just comes down to math because it's dollars. So how much tax revenue will be held back by holding Bitcoin, number one? How much tax revenue will be held back by not paying taxes on the Bitcoin that you have that you're supposed to pay? What number is that? Is it a, a million dollars? Is it a billion dollars? Um, like what is it? And if you get the market cap of Bitcoin, I mean, I mean, it's, it's like nowhere close. If you just look at like how many people have Bitcoin, how does that compare to the trillion dollar, $20 trillion, you know, um, budget of the U S government? I mean, it's not 0.00001%. I mean, that's just such an extraordinary claim that I, it's just, it's hard for me. I mean, I, I, believe thinking that for a long, long time. And then I, until I started to try to put numbers on it. And then to me, it, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very tough, but you know, just bigger picture. That's one issue is taxation, hyper Bitcoinization. Those are just yeah, issues. But, you know, I think the real problem is the environment. There's just not like, look at the shit I've so, gotten so, but I'm saying for like, asking, I think basic questions. Keep doing what you're doing, but do it like that. You know, like if, if we look at, like if we consider and take into account the U.S. population, and we just assume a percentage that owns Bitcoin for an, a model outcome, the price of Bitcoin now versus like what what it could get to, and then the number of IRS employees. I mean, you can make very vague, like it'll have a very high margin of error um, and be very simplistic, but like you can get an idea of like at this price with this percentage of Bitcoin, like it's hurting the government this much. And it would cost this much manpower devoted just to this to really deal with that and really start looking at like at different sizes of things, you know, how much would that actually dent things? Yeah. And I think those claims, though, as the burden of proof is on the people making the claims. So I don't think I should have to say why I don't believe it so much as people need to say why they think it can happen. And that's how science works. Like I have a, a background in statistics and, and medical research and, and medicine. Mm -hmm. And and there it's it's all about obviously probabilities and then it's about evidence-based medicine. So that that's what medicine is these days, is you can't propose a treatment, whether it's a drug or a radiation or something, unless you have peer-reviewed research showing the efficacy of something. So if you make a claim, it's a, it's on you to back it up. And so that's the opposite of what's happening now. We have the claims, but there's no uh, proof or reasoning or numbers or anything to support it other than, well, if this happens in this way, then that will happen, which isn't, to me, it's it's beyond flimsy. So I think the burden is, is, is there. And so I don't know why people are so offended when I just say, hey, well, what proof do you have? Like, what evidence do you have? What does that look like? What are some numbers? You know, that's, I might try to problem. put together uh, and write something, a simple napkin math model, uh, and, and build that case for you, Ragnar. Yeah, that'd be great. So then you say, okay, Ragnar, here's my claim. Here's how I see it happening. And then we could have the conversation, say, well, this number, okay, or not. That's that's what needs to happen is the case needs to be laid out. And and I think nothing can be assumed. See, that's I, my background is in science. So nothing is assumed. It's like you, you say something, well, prove it or at least get, make a case. I don't have to attack why that's wrong. And I think that's how Bitcoin should function more as science 
rather than as, as memes, unless we're joking, but mostly we're not. So that's how Bitcoin should function, just like it does with the code. You make a claim, you have to back it up. Someone doesn't have to attack it. And if someone does attack it, you should say, thank you. Thank you for your skepticism and thank you for your adversarial thinking rather than different things people have said in the last couple of weeks. You know, I think I'm going to write this and then we have a reason to bring you on again. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. So I guess uh, no part. Janine, you guys had any uh, last comments or any last questions for Ragnar? Yes. Come back and work on Bitcoin instead. <laughs> no, no, keep the gun space accelerating. Please do. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I've, I've, uh, this is like, I, I could say, like, right now in my life, that this is like the most excited I've been about Bitcoin and the absolute most depressed. I'm most excited about Bitcoin because it's just so strong and everything we know, it's just that the UX the scaling, like even the price. I mean, it's, it's never been stronger in that sense, but to me, I'm also s suddenly kind of this, the most depressed I've been because of the tax issue. And I've seen, wow, people aren't using Bitcoin to buy stuff because they're thinking about tax. Wow. Like we really do have to pay taxes on gains. Like, wow, the government can absolutely put a lien on your house if you don't pay your Bitcoin. Like, and just having to even think about taxes and even talk about it, it just shows shit. Like <sighs> Bitcoin is just, it's just not as self as, as sovereign as, as we thought it was. And it's under the state a lot more than we thought it was going to be. And I never thought I was going to have to think about taxes with Bitcoin last couple of years. I got things in order, but I just, I just, to me, it's the most depressed I've been about Bitcoin. And then on the same breath, the most excited because I think it's also strong in some ways. So I, I guess I'm completely bipolar when it comes to Bitcoin. Yeah, well, most I of think, us are. yeah, I think the problems that most people you will encounter on Twitter are not, they're not focusing on like they have Bitcoin and they think their job is done. They haven't actually thought like, am I, do I have sovereignty now? They haven't, they haven't looked at it more broadly in their life. Like a lot of them, live in apartments where you know if the power gets cut out they're screwed like they won't survive for a week that's how most people in cities live um so i think showing people that that's the issue that you know you can't just like you know if, if someone like lives on like their own property and grows their own food and stuff and whatever and they don't even make an income that's you know ta worth taxing really then buying Bitcoin on Coinbase, I don't give a shit about that because, you know, what are, they've sacrificed some privacy, but they're already living a lifestyle that is, you know, so much more free than most people. And so the, the damage to them is minimal, whereas people that are highly dependent on others and haven't haven't achieved those goals, they're they're the ones that are at risk. And so every little every little tick on the checkbox like oh i've just doxed myself to another company uh they're they're much more at risk than those people are yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and that's why i went back to that that's why i brought up the idea of a, a small town where everyone pays cash doesn't use the banking system and grows they grow their own food they don't have that tax you know enough money to even bother being taxed even if they can collect it because it's cash to me that's more effective than ten thousand people buying bitcoin on Coinbase and hodling it. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so you know this is oh this has been a real fun conversation, Ragnar. Um, I'm gonna have uh, I think a fun time in the editing room trying to get this in order, but it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good luck. Well, um, I'd love to, I'd love to come back on, not to invite myself, and um, but I would love to revisit this stuff, and hopefully it'd be it'd be fun to like do an episode or someone puts together a conference or a half day thing or something where we take like the top three biggest like rosy scenarios of bitcoin you know stopping wars hyper bitcoinization and something else and that's the topic and you have one side saying these are all the reasons why it'll happen and the other side saying these are the reasons why it won't and i could take both sides i think that'd be a lot of fun i, I would maybe yeah. no one else does definitely man and uh, before we finally wrap up, I insist that you uh, show your podcast again. 
Okay. Um, I won't turn down any opportunity to show the podcast. So yeah, it's just gunsandbitcoin.com. You'll see the podcast there. We try to do it once a week, uh, really focused on being practical when it comes to financial self-sovereignty, physical security, all of those things. So really try to be practical, try to focus on the doers. Uh, we have a lot of 3D gun printing stuff. We've got some good episodes coming up, one with Frank Braun, one with a 3D gun printer, and some more in the works. So uh, just go to the website, gunsandbitcoin.com. And if you like it, give us a rating and review. It helps us. And also we have hats and a gun case that you can buy to support us. Mm -hmm. And I insist you you do listen. The, uh, the gun episodes are obviously amazing if you want to keep up with that stuff. And the Bitcoin stuff is very centered around you yourself and handling things and being skeptical so yeah shinobi stamp of approval all right i'm gonna i'm gonna make up a review and put your name on it i'm just gonna Go quote ahead. you create a fake account but um yeah you know it's it's been fun ragnar you know thanks for uh for coming on and i hope everybody yeah. listening enjoyed yeah thanks for tolerating me and thanks for having me on mm -hmm. all right punks uh we will catch you next time adios bye 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 Hello, Hello, stands here in white.